Hello and welcome to another podcast of Mr. J Talks Continuous Provision. Today, I'm joined by Charlotte, who is our EYFS teacher at St. Paul's Primary School. Um, Charlotte, should we start off by basically introducing what we're going to be talking about today, which is effective transition into year one. Do you want to give a basic outline of what happens in your EYFS classroom? Okay, so we follow a mainly continuous provision um, way of teaching. So we will, I'm quite lucky in terms of our group sizing in our classroom. So we will make sure that when the children come in in the morning, we do a lot of plan, do and review, and we really focus to get the children engaged in what they're actually going to go off and do in their child provision, um, their continuous provision time. So we will go around to each child, we'll look at the resources that are out, and they will make that plan for themselves. Um, and then when they go off, they might follow that plan, and us as practitioners will remember and remember from the discussions that we've had and try and bring those skills into what they're doing. And then we will really put a lot of emphasis on that reviewing. So that's all of their language skills coming back. How did you get on? What did you change? How could you make it better next time? So that each time their continuous provision is developed to the next step. It's not children continually going to the same activity, doing the same thing. Um, so we'll really have that discussions about how they can make it better next time. What skills did they use this time? What skills will they use next time? Um, so. Yeah, I mean, do you want me to say anything else? No, or... that's, that's absolutely perfect. And I think, I think to start off this whole podcast, what I think needs to be understood is that the whole continuous provision movement in our school stemmed from what was happening in the early years classroom. Um, I often tell the story of how um, kind of the movement was spurred on from the fact that I remember walking past your class and talking to a child who was, um, I think you were doing the topic on the hungry caterpillar, um, and a child was just so fascinated and hooked um, into the idea of caterpillars growing into butterflies um, and just wanted to talk and talk and talk and tell me about all the different parts of his learning that linked back to the core kind of grip that you had them under of using the hungry caterpillar as a, almost like an enhancement that I would do in my classroom um, and but they just wanted to talk about it they were making signs they were doing art about it and they were just so engaged and I think What's really important to understand is that that amazing work is we wanted to bring through the school. Yeah, so we don't necessarily um, always have a theme. We'll follow a key text. Um, some texts will mainly come from um, the power of reading. And then we will really try and hook them in through that key text but if a child wants to go off and do something else then we're very much open to that and that's why a lot of our we've moved away from themed role play areas mm. um outdoors we don't have set areas for set like um parts of the learning very much deconstructed and from that move we found the children's imagination just Spot. so more engaged so more into what they're doing, can talk about what they're doing, know what skills they're using because it's interesting for them and it's mm. not being forced upon them. Yes. Um, and one thing that really sticks with me is when we went on, I think I wasn't with you actually, James, I was with another TA in our, club, in our school. We went on the Alistair Bryce Clegg training and he was like, you don't want children Christmas time, for example, to be making exactly the same card. Come over here, put your handprint down. We're making a reindeer today. And every single 30 card looks exactly the same. It's almost what skill have they got out of making that card? Yeah. So that's, that's something that really stuck with me from his training because it was actually something we used to do. Yeah. And it made us reflect upon our own practice and think, well, actually, there's no skill in just reproducing the same thing for every single child. And so now every single child has that very new, unique journey. Um, yeah, which I think they're thriving with. Exactly. And I, I think that's a good point to, to mention is that Alistair Bryce Clegg's work has inspired us to kind of form that transition. I've got the book yeah. about effective transition into, um, into year one. And I think you know between us two we've we've all often spoken about his work but we've also gone to see other schools where that's been put yeah. in place um and i i think what we're going to talk about now is the actual uh, specific techniques that were used uh, for transition and obviously we're aware that this year's transition is going to be miles apart from previous um transition years but what we want to do is always give you some techniques to 
um, think about what are the what what do we do at our school? So Charlotte, do you want to mention some of the things that we do from the EYFS perspective, getting them ready for life in year one? Yeah, definitely. Um, so something that I feel all EYFS and year one teachers and SLT need to remember is when children join year one, they're actually only six weeks older than when they left reception. So you think, oh, they're going up into key stage one, they're moving into this whole different part of their learning. Yes, they are, but they're not actually as ready for it mm. as people think, right, they're year one, they're gonna be sat at desks. Excellent. No, they're not ready for that. So we mm. really, as a school, took that on board and thought about how we can make our transition better. So we're very lucky now to have both year one and year two following a continuous provision, which naturally now does flow and help with our transition. But things that we have put in place from probably around this sort of time through to the end of the year, um, we step up the skill level in reception ready for what they will see come um, when they enter the year one classroom. So we feel that the last part of reception, their environment should be reflected in that first few weeks, even up to a month or two yes. in year one. So that when they're coming through, they know the resources, they know how to use things, they are familiar with different strategies, familiar with different routines, so that it makes them feel more comfortable, more safe, more secure. If you've got mm -hmm. a child that's happy, a child that is willing to come into school and want to learn, then the other skills will fall into place. So I really try and push the children into thinking about that whole plan, do, review cycle that goes up to almost like a new level. So say if they're wanting to go and build in our block area, we would still talk about it because throughout the um, year of reception, it's very much a verbalised plan. But we would then encourage them to start drawing their plan, to start annotating with labels, to start thinking a little bit deeper because that's the expectation in year one. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to prepare them for what the new continuous provision might look like in that new skill level. Um, in things like um, James's class, he has the um, independent journals that they do. So it's just making sure when we're in reception they know how to take a picture they know how to cut round and they know how to stick in and things like that just so it's not all new exactly um, and i'd say it's all about that rehearsal isn't it you know yeah. starting it off in eyfs just gives you that massive upper hand when it comes to them being in year one too and it's Definitely. not really and okay. choose choose the children that you are going to start it with don't choose the children that are going to be um I don't know that you're going to find it really difficult to start those new skills with choose mm -hmm. the children that you know are ready to go and print their own picture yes. start off that process with the children that are ready and then naturally the other children will start seeing those children doing it and be intrigued by it and want to do it too and then it makes our job as practitioners so much easier when mm -hmm. children almost want to be like what's going on and want to push themselves to the next level and be able yeah. to do that for themselves too because they want that sense of independence exactly yes is it modeling through children in, in definitely a, definitely um i think the other thing we need to talk about charlotte is that um that almost relationship between teacher parents and child um and i think that played a massive part in our transition from eyfs to year one we did a lot of work over the summer holiday on bringing parents into the classroom um, and allowing them to see the, the environment. But prior to that, I think the teacher element of that, I think our, us two played the role of handover um, and, and playing that handover role was so, so important because you, you always forget that children invest themselves into you for a whole year. And that must be incredibly hard to give that up and put that trust and put that faith into a completely different adult that they're not used to on a regular basis. Um, so I think, you know, from my, from our experience of this, I, you know, we, we both popped in and out of each other's classrooms quite frequently, engaged in conversations with the children, participated in the learning. And I think one of those, I know this won't be the same this year, but going forward, you know, I think one of the most effective tools to transition for me was spending time with the children not only in the new environment that they were going to come and playing but in your environment definitely 
<laughs> if I add upon that, I do like for our transition, we make sure that time is key. So the amount of time they spend with their new teacher. So for instance, in your PPA time, you used to spend half yeah. of it actually coming into the EYFS classroom and using even if it's just half an hour, exactly. Like working alongside the children in their own environment. Yes. And I, when the new children for the September intake come into and have their taster days and have their stay and play and their teddy bears picnic, all of the transition that we do for the new intake, my current reception would go in to the year one class and actually experience what it's like in the new classroom with you as well. So they almost get extra transition than what we offer the rest of the school yeah, because and we know that the jump from eyfs to exactly that key stage one is so much greater mm. um, but like what you said earlier so for those real vulnerable children that we think right they haven't met the early learning goals they're not at a good level of development they are going to struggle with this transition more than any other child in that cohort we do make sure that they have that extra opportunity so like what you were saying earlier the opportunity to come in on our staff inset days and look at the classroom ready set up for September yeah. um, send in social stories home pictures mm -hmm. of the classroom pictures of the teachers so that they can take that home with them and they can be sharing that with their family mm -hmm. that's been really successful um, yeah and just making sure that we are there for them so you see them in the playground you're able yeah. to have that chat and it's not like oh you're not in my class yet we're not going to talk yeah. <laughs> it's just all around the school i mean we're like that anyway with any children but yes. it's just making sure that they feel comfortable. heightened yeah Definitely. exactly that so charlotte in terms of transitioning in light of covid and um, we all know it's going to be a difficult transition this year potentially some of these children haven't been to school for some time now um, do you want to discuss some of the things we're doing in light of that, the difficulties that are presenting themselves? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be hard for all schools. Um, it's, it's great that we've both got year one and early years back at school. So they are in the trying to get them back into the routine of actually being at school. Um, but in light of not being able to obviously move into different parts of the school and actually meet physically because of in terms of our bubbles mm -hmm. um, we are going to do some different things this year still to try and to support it so we've had discussions around um, being outside and for my bubble of reception to go and meet yourself as their new teacher at a distance so you would be maybe two meters apart reading them a story and they would be together so they're still able to be with you but at a distance mm -hmm. uh, we've said about zoom phone calls for those children that are most vulnerable and we know are going to struggle with that transition to maybe speak to them even if it's at home um, and also maybe to do zoom class assemblies so it's a way of them again having your time being able to talk to you in a capacity where they can ask you questions, you can talk to them about things that they're going to do. Mm -hmm. But it is difficult because they wouldn't have maybe spent as much time in their new classroom as we would have hoped. But we're going to really, and fingers crossed that we will be able to um, do this in September and maybe restrictions might be eased a little bit more. But when they're in their new classroom, really think about, okay, usually the expectation of year one is maybe at a certain level we're just going to drop that a little bit and give them a little bit more time to actually get used to their environment i mean we were quite lucky before lockdown that the children spent a lot of time around the school in different classrooms we do a thing called team teach so the children actually got taught each week by a different teacher including yourself so they're very aware of different parts and different classrooms they're very aware of that's the classroom they're going to so mm -hmm. we're very lucky in that sense I think for schools that maybe haven't had that, it's very important when children are going back into school in September to think, okay, they haven't had that chance to be in this classroom. Yes. How can we maybe allow for that in these mm -hmm. circumstances and just reduce expectation a little bit and give them a bit more time to get used to stuff? Exactly that. And I think, you know, people that watch the webinar would know that we spoke about learning challenges and um, we spoke about enhancements, but ultimately what I try to get across in those webinars is that the continuous provision part of it is the most important part. Um, and if children 
to do effective continuous provision and for it to be effective going forward. We need them to be safe and feel stimulated by the environment. Um, and that for me means that actually you might have to put the learning challenges on the back burner. Yeah. Um, and you might have to say, right, we're going to invest this time, these first couple of weeks of the autumn term into continuation of transition. We need to get the children knowing that this is the expectations from this classroom. These are the kind of the routines and new structures of this classroom. And that's going to take what more or longer than normal. The advantage we have, and I get a lot of people on my Twitter feed asking about this, about mixed form entries, that we have a group of year twos next year that would have gone through a whole year of transition. Um, and I will be thinking about particularly my most vulnerable children in year one next year, about how can I pair them up with someone that's going to guide them through that transition period. I also think, picking up on your earlier point, the fact that we're, we're going to be looking at things like a virtual tour of the classroom that we can send home to parents um, and so they can share with their children the classroom and, and me talking about what, what can you do in the classroom and maybe even using some of my children who I've got in my bubble at the moment to be part of that tour. The people they're going to be um, learning with, giving them the tour, you know, talking the child talk would be really, really helpful. So there's a whole host of things that we want to do. You know, obviously we're saying this prior to September. We might be saying something completely different in September and we're learning it. But I'm sure whatever happens, you know, at first and foremost, we need, we need to put the child's needs and levels of development at the forefront of what we're doing. And, and we're Definitely. with such a significant amount of time out of their learning. There's going to be significant almost um, barriers that are going to present themselves that we wouldn't have prepared for. Um, because re realistically, we've gone three months without formalised learning in the classroom back to being at school where some children haven't chosen to come back yet to then obviously our six weeks holiday too. So it's, 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 a, it's a game really that we're going to have to really, the highs and lows of this roller coaster. Exactly. And then we're going to get to September again, not knowing what might present as what a classroom looks like again but we're just going to have to really think about the children first like what we do in everything yes, it's exactly. about the children um <clears throat> and if they need more time if they need more time to settle then that's what i'm sure everybody would do and it's it's not about forcing them into this new new environment you're better off i would say putting more time like you've said earlier into that continuous provision setting those boundaries setting those rules setting those expectations so that you're then not catching your tail through the rest of the terms yeah, completely um, so next topic we're going to talk about charlotte is the what does an eyfs environment and this is what some people have called it um in year one look like i think what the real kind of essence of this is what does continuous provision how does it look different to what it looks like in eyfs um, I mean, when we worked together to set the year one and two classroom up, we did have this discussion a lot mm. and we discussed how are we going to make it different? How is it going to be different, look different and actually behave in a different way? Well, the question is, it doesn't actually look different. It behaves differently because we're trying to up their skill level. Mm. So I'm sure you've probably spoken about before that the environment is key children need to know where things are children need to know what's on offer so they can then start to make these plans yes so we still have in my eyfs classroom a sandpit year one two classroom has a sandpit we still have small world area small world area but there are similarities across the board but it's what's expected in those areas that makes the difference exactly so for instance no oh, go on no we, so i was just going to say like I think a big analogy of that is that we don't want children to be doing the same thing as they're doing in EYFS in a key stage one classroom. Definitely. You know, and is the, the best example of that, isn't it? Where, you know, there's some fantastic, I'm not doubting that, there's some, there's some fantastic sound work that happens in EYFS classroom on a daily basis. But what I would want to see is that children in year two, for example, and year one in this case, we're looking at transition, are, are doing exactly the same thing. Yes, if they're doing exactly the same thing in the first couple of weeks of transition, we completely understand that, but it's our responsibility as the practitioners in that room and the facilitators of the learning to move them on from that and start thinking about, okay, so this is EYFS level of playing with sand. What is year one and two level of playing with sand? And that's where it comes in as us as practitioners, because it also comes down to what resources you're putting out for them. Mm. So for an EYFS 
sandpit, there might be buckets and cups. Whereas when we go into a year one sandpit, you might find shovels, you might find smaller spoons because the dexterity in their hands are better. They've got better fine motor and it might, you just need to really think about where sand play starts and then how it gets up and up and up and think about those learning behaviors mm. it's the same with our small world areas so we both have yes. similar items but what's expected in my small world area is for them to use their language their role play development yeah. whereas in your year one two class it's thinking okay well how can we actually write stories and document this? that and how can we actually use what we've learned in our maybe key um in our key group where you've been your focus groups where you've been talking about maybe story language how are you going to use that in our small world area exactly that and i'd say that was one of my biggest learning curves of my first year doing continuous provision if you remember charlotte i didn't have a small world uh, to start with because i think I, I i think between us we both kind of thought well actually we don't need that to start with because you know small world just about playing with figures um, and and starting to use the language what i want my children to be doing is writing um, and i think what we learned a great deal of in the first term was that actually the vital nature that small world has um, and yes you're spot on small world looks exactly like it may look exactly like it does in any YFS classroom but the role it plays is completely different in the sense of I have children that are using their focus group knowledge and applying it I didn't think at the start of the third year that I needed a small world area but by the end of the first term boy was I missing it I was thinking to myself actually I've got a group of children here that are not retelling stories in the way that I want them to. How am I going to change my environment? And then that meant me having to take a step back into that transition period and think, right, what did they have in EYFS that was getting them to this point? And how am I going to take that and go forward with it? Uh, and Small World became a vital, had a vital role. But also, um, I think that you forget how important Small World is. Yeah, so exactly. that's how children are making sense of the world, replaying scenarios that they've been through. And mm -hmm. I think particularly if we're thinking about transition with COVID, small world will play an enormous part. Oh, yes. So children that might not have actually wanted to speak about stuff to start with, if they've got those resources there, they're almost going to reenact scenarios that have happened exactly in that. their own home life mm -hmm. through their play and through that. So it's almost not just about story writing and language, it's about actually being able to open up their own emotions as oh, well and re replay, retell. Um, yeah, so I think that's one of the key things that we actually moved in. Um, I think in terms of writing areas and things like that, we don't have a set writing yes. area in mm -hmm. both classes. We have resources for writing throughout. Yes. Um, and we make sure that the environment i don't know if you've mentioned this previously but the whole shadowing of objects um that's the same in both classrooms so when they move through into the year one two classroom they know okay where things belong it helps in that ownership of their class it, they know mm. what's there um just trying to think what else we have that prepares them for the environment I mean, we did take a lot of stuff away. So, for example, um, some of the construction things that I have in my class, it's not appropriate for year one and year two. So exactly. you have to really think, what is the level of skill they have mm -hmm. and how are our resources helping that? Exactly so that. that. And that's part of that conversation, isn't it? In terms yeah. of between us, about us identifying particular children and saying, right, what are their gross motor skills like? Right, so if you've had... Um, construction in terms of Duplo, like he was about to say, in EYFS, and we feel that their construction at, is at a age-appropriate level, a developmentally appropriate level, then that's not what we need to take them forward from now. We need to upskill. Exactly. So I might only have Duplo out in EYFS for the first term because I know some children might have really poor fine motor, but I wouldn't keep Duplo out for the whole, for the whole of the year because I know there's no progression there. Mm -hmm. So we really looked at... we. We put all of the um, resources, didn't we, out? Yes. And then we really thought about, okay, how is this going to move them on? Does it? No. If it doesn't, we donated it to preschools or yeah. it moved back into the EYFS classroom. Mm -hmm. So in terms of water play, I've got a lot of maybe boats for floating and sinking. I've got different size measuring drugs, things like that. But actually in year one it's more focused measuring and they've got um you've got all of the different intervals on the scales of the measuring you've got chances for them to actually 
engage in that further, exactly. which then relates to your kids' stage one curriculum. curriculum. Exactly, exactly that. And, and that's not to say that, you know, in my classroom, we do get children that want to just float and sink things. And that's absolutely fine. But as long as that's not just what they're doing the whole time, and again, using that role of the adult and going over to them and saying, right, we're doing this. And I've, I saw you doing that in reception. What do we think we can do now with this? And you start, I think one of the examples I can give there is that um, we did a, uh, an enhancement, a topic around the Great Fire of London. And we were talking about boats going down the River Thames and how, you know, during the time people fled on boats. And we were also, I wanted them to try to think about materials and appropriate materials. So floating and sinking came into that. But how did I upscale that? Well, I got them to document their journey um, and I let them do that in whatever way they wanted. Some children decided to make a film about it. Um, some children decided to write an actual write-up of it. Some children decided to draw pictures of different stages. And, and what they did is that they, they effectively accessed the national curriculum for the suitability of different materials. Um, they effectively were able to um, judge about what's a fair test. Um, but they did that in a, an environment, in a, in a setup that they've been using since inception the water play area. Mm -hmm. It hasn't changed. Our water play areas in terms of the size of them and where they are, are very, very similar. But the way they're using it, again, and I think we're going to mention this a lot and a lot, is different through how do you get there? You get there through facilitating it through the adults, but also having conversations with children when you do your focus um, groups or your teacher input at the start of the week and saying, actually, it, it's so important to model the area. Although you might want to... Um, dwell on the curriculum objectives and model that to a high standard it's so important to get into that environment and model play and model effectively be play there with them. To shadow. Yeah. you know Definitely. if you're not doing it and there's nobody who's going to challenge and stretch them they they're not going to be able to further their learning and further their their development it's almost like i, I know you'll probably laugh at this because i mentioned quite a lot but it's almost like that vygotsky theory of learning from the more able other if, if that person is not there to learn from, they are not going to go forward. But that's the whole theory of continuous provision. It should yeah. be continued without an adult, but they almost exactly need that. the adult there first to show them how to re use these new resources because they may be not be the same from our early years classroom. So they need that modelling for you to then walk away and for that provision to be the same as if an adult was there. Yes. Um, and then obviously for you to enhance that with different questioning and maybe steering of learning based on your knowledge of the national curriculum you might mm -hmm. lead them down a, a way that actually they are able to achieve different skills um, yeah. so yeah I think it, it is having a sense of knowing different objectives in the national curriculum and knowing what you can get from different resources too exactly that we, we went through that up. stage of highlighting the national curriculum didn't we and we we stuck it in the cupboards in my classroom in areas of the national curriculum we felt that the air, the provision adequately enabled yeah. the children to access we highlighted and then we were left with kind of right so we've got these gaps how are we going these to the key skills yeah yeah exactly um i think the other, one last thing we'll talk about on the area before we move on to our final phase of this is the fact that what does in challenge um look like in the environment in comparison between EYFS and Key Stage 1. And, and when I say that, I mean, so for example, in my classroom, I think it would be very easy to walk in um, and see, you know, I have those signs on tables and in areas that say, can you do this? Can you do this? And, and that's my directed enhancement. It's my directed challenge. Um, but I think what people often realize once they spend time in there, and this is what we try to foster and why we invest so much time at the start of that uh, year, the academic year, is what happens when you're not there, the implicit challenge that comes from that. The idea that children will challenge themselves over the course of time because they know that's what's expected of them. To take something at its base value isn't good enough. They need to challenge it and roll with it and use it and regurgitate it and do what they need to do. Yeah. I think that's something that we try to instill in reception with the plan do review. So they mm. planned it, they've done it. And then we say, how are you going to make it better? Yeah. So we praise what they've done. We praise the skill that they've achieved, but so that they don't go back and carry out the same activity, same activity. Yeah. It's okay. Well, great. How are you going to, how are you going to go about this tomorrow? Because a lot of children like to do things over and over again. And because they feel comfortable. To, yeah, that's their comfortable, that's their safety blanket. And it's actually them, if they are le learning a new skill, they're, they're perfecting that new skill. But mm. us as practitioners, when we know they've perfected it, 
and they're ready to actually step out of that comfort zone, it's well, actually how are you going to make it better now? Yeah. So it, having that discussion, that language in reception for them to talk about, we're not just going to do the same thing. We are wanting to get better and we're wanting to be better learners so that they're ready when they come to year one of actually there isn't an adult here but do you know what i'm going to try and use the deans today rather than the counters or i'm going to actually try and think about different adverbs i'm going to put into my writing today rather than just stick to the same ones that we were using yesterday so i think children naturally i mean don't get me wrong there will be those children in the class that you have got to gear up and you have got to yes feel that motivation in we all have those children mm -hmm. and we're not going to lie and say we don't. We do. No. Yeah, of but we do. generally, you want children to own their independence and to own their learning. And I think yes. that's what's unique, really, about fostering that continuous provision in year one and year two. You see that more. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the, how else you support that is through your displays <laughs> on the environment. We place a lot of emphasis on the um, displays around the school and particularly in making sure that they're similar um, and uniform across all classrooms and i think yeah. that helps a lot every classroom has a maths working wall that is got handwritten examples of children's work and you know we we regularly photocopy stuff and put it up on the wall that the children mm -hmm. have written and use that as a model and saying look look at this this is great and with continuous provision particularly in key stage one but i, I bet you'll say the same charlotte for you YFS, is that you need to be able to say this is the expectation and now I need you to look at this and how are you going to take the expectation further? Definitely. It's the environment think... used as a tool for celebrating work, but also yeah. almost inspiring children to go further with it. Yeah, and something that I'd like to add upon that in reception is we take photographs of the children um, in that area. So for instance, in my construction area, I've got photographs of things that children have made. So children that might not usually like going in that area might be inspired one day. Oh, I'm going to make this car that Arthur made yesterday. And mm -hmm. they can then see how he's made it and try to replicate it. Or if it's in my maths area that I've got pictures of children using Numicon, pictures of children using different numbers to recreate yeah. things. So it almost brings on that expectation again, like you were just saying, and also that sense of, children inspiring their peers as well to go and carry out things as well. Yeah, exactly that. Okay, Charlotte, final question that we've got is someone's asked on Twitter, what are we thinking about with regards to planning for continuous provision in year one with autumn one in mind? Now, with autumn one in mind that we've just had a period of lockdown, that there won't be children um, at where they were on their journey, their, their learning journey, as we know all children do anyway, but their learning journey might have taken a significant fall um, what are we doing in terms of planning for continuous provision in year one for, with that in mind? I mean, just like you said, I mean, it's been quite evident for me in reception that children's learning has taken a, a fall, um, despite any online stuff that's been put out there, just their ability to retain information. Mm -hmm. So the expectation of where children are going to come in is going to be significantly lower than in previous years. So our environment needs to reflect that and it needs to reflect the level that they're going to be working at. So I think, like we mentioned earlier, small play is going to play a really big part. Um, they're going to need to have the same maths resources maybe that they were using in reception um, in these last few weeks that we're at school together and then slowly introduce the more complex um, resources that we have at school like maybe um like we we're always using the same really if you think about it like our double-sided counters we have in both yeah, classrooms yeah, yeah. Consistency. The same in both classrooms so it's just thinking about what they're used to and making sure that that's continued in their new classroom um, it may be that come after october half term it does change slightly but you don't want to change it too much to the point where they then don't know where things are it's yeah. going to be a gradual change a gradual enhancement. Um, we were just speaking earlier that it's going to be quite challenging really for us in a mixed class where you're going to have um, the year ones luckily would have been at school as well but for those children that haven't been at school bringing them back into a routine yeah. again is there's going to be a lot of different challenges that we wouldn't see on a normal new year. Of course. Um, 
And so I think there's going to be a lot of time that's going to need to be invested in talk, in mm. just discussion around things and getting them school ready again. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I completely agree. I think the biggest thing we're going to have to do as teachers is the the expectation around, I, I, you know, when we get children in year one anyway, they're, they're very reluctant to write lots and lots and lots at the start of the year. It always is the case. Now more than ever, we're going to have to find alternative ways to document what they're doing and spark that creativity, spark that learning. So if that's a case of a lot of you jotting down what they're saying to start with, um, if that's a case of using technology in ways that you haven't used before. So for example, using films like I, um, iMovie and things like that to document their journey that way and you teach them how to do that. That's what we're going to have to do. I think one practical piece of advice that I'd like to give, I've been thinking about, I've been thinking about Autumn One a lot in the moment, um, is extending Autumn One, um, your learning obje- a topic, for example, for that particular term. So with that in mind, I'm doing Neil Armstrong um, and his you know, impact um, in living memory. But what I've decided is that's going to last over two terms. And the reason for that, with particularly COVID in mind, is the fact that I will have enough time then to really go into detail, explore at the level I need eventually. But I'm not naive to the fact that a lot of the stuff at the start of the year is going to be about getting them ready to learn again. Uh, and now more than ever. And so Just maybe example, taking time, I think, into their well-being. Yes, like exactly what we said that. at the beginning of this meeting, like we've both said, it, if a child isn't ready to learn, they're not going to learn. Yes. If a child isn't happy, if a child isn't safe, they're not mm-hmm. going to be ready to take on that new learning. Exactly. So, that. like what you just said, it's going to be a lot of time just invested in making sure they are ready. Yeah. Um, and as much as we can do before the summer term, we can try and we can try, but they've still got that six weeks holiday yes. and then coming back into a routine again. Mm-hmm. And as much as we can try before the summer holidays, there are still children that are choosing to remote learn. So yes. there's going to be a lot of difficulties in making sure everybody's ready. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think you're right in, in stretching that because things are going to take longer. Yes. Don't put too much pressure on yourself to make it be exactly. like any other year. It's yeah. not going to like any other you, you're not going to be able to cover you know one of the trickiest things i get asked quite a lot is and one of the trickiest things for me sorry is the fact that how do you cover national curriculum objectives in, in continuous provision well actually at the moment I, they are going to be able to access that and i can promise you they're going to be able to access that but right now like you just said we need to focus on the well-being and sparking that love of learning again and i think what we have to do as teachers and one of the tips i'd give people is that we have to be willing to Think about the continuous provision environment. And if you've set it up and it looks amazing, and I see, you know, we both go on Instagram quite a lot and look through people's environments and go, wow, this is amazing, this is amazing. But sometimes you've got to be not so proud as a practitioner and say, right, I'm going to have to change this. I've worked so hard on setting this up, but these children are not ready to access this provision. I'm going to have to take that step back. And that's why I think, if anything, we want to get out of this webinar is the fact that they need to be thinking, is it more like an EYFS environment than it is like the standard key stage one environment at the moment. And I think we need to make sure that that reflection is even clearer than normal. Because if it's not, there is going to be some real barriers when children come in and they're going to hit those barriers and keep rebounding off of them go forward and i mean we we talk a lot in those initial weeks when a child mm. moves into year one anyway but i think that's going to be even more so after the summer break and i think as well like although we've done um a lot of transition b- between us already like discussing certain pupils and doing our transition meetings that's going to change again within yeah. a month's time so I think communication between the early years and year one is key for them to actually see um, moderation. We'd usually do that together, but obviously Mm -hmm. the EYFS isn't being moderated this year or it doesn't have to be set off. But we would, we would still talk and we would still make sure that you can see what it's like and actually so that there's a, there's an agreement there. It's not like, okay, this data is being pushed up to year one this is where they're at and then you have the year one teachers looking at thinking no I don't agree with this like it really does need to be a joint effort Mm -hmm. so that you're both on the same page and you're both actually working together because otherwise there is I know in many schools 
the the blame issue comes in oh well actually yeah. eyfs set them up as expected and yes. i don't think they are whereas if you've done it together then you're in it together there's and no you argument about together it for the yeah. best of the child, not exactly for data and I, I know an awful lot of senior leadership teams watch these webinars and, and talk to me about you know trying to push this vision across and that element of accountability is going to be a, it's going to be a tough conversation really isn't it you know there's going to be children that not by the fault of the teacher not by the fault of the child but by the fault of this global crisis they would have fallen behind yeah. and, and you know if if you are one of those slt members that still thinks that progress is linear and it's going to go forward now is a better time than ever to realize that's not the case um, and that this is probably now the time to reflect on that and think how what's best to support our teachers to give them the platform to enable the children to progress with their learning and, and almost you know a, ba a term that keeps them getting bounded around a lot at the moment is the recovery curriculum mm. um, well this is the recovery curriculum you know reflecting the previous one and moving forward with it Okay, so that's all for this week's uh, podcast. I just want to say a massive thank you to Charlotte for coming on. Um, like I said at the start of the podcast, Charlotte's played a fundamental role in what continuous provision looks like at stage one. And without her, this project would be nowhere near what it is at the moment. I, I, Charlotte and I often laughed. A couple of months ago, we were inspected by Ofsted and I sat in the classroom as the reading lead and the inspector said, oh, so what do you think? And I turned to the inspector and said, it's, it's just so magical in this classroom. We laugh about it, but it really, really is. Um, so I just want to say a massive thank you. <laughs> I just want to say a massive thank you to Charlotte. Um, we will be back with more podcasts. Uh, ben and I are going to be doing a podcast on what does continuous provision look like specifically for year two, because I know there's been a lot of questions on that. Um, and hopefully that will be live in the next couple of days. So thank you, Charlotte. Uh, and goodbye.